All right, I believe we should be ready to go here on another edition of Dodgers Dogs as part of the Dodgers Daily Network. My name is Austin Brubaker. You can follow me on X or Twitter uh, at AustinBRU99. I'm excited. I'll be your co-host for the evening. It's going to be a good, it's going to be a fun show. It's going to be a show that I'm sure many of you out there, based on the past series and based off of some of the news that we've gotten over the past recent couple of days, might be a little bit concerned with the Dodgers, with some of the bottom of the lineup, with the bullpen, with the health of pitchers. I totally understand that. We're going to be going through that. We're going to be working through potentially some of the frustrations. We're going to be looking at things potentially through different angles, looking at some of the underlying statistical things that we want to uh, evaluate to get a better understanding of some players. It's going to be a fun, it's going to be an exciting show today, but it wouldn't be a good show today on April 15th if I didn't start off by wishing everybody a happy Jackie Robinson Day. The impact that he made on the game of baseball cannot be understated he made such a great impact not just in the game of baseball culturally and the game of sports and he was a pretty phenomenal baseball player too occurring through baseball reference 64 war batted 313 and the impact that he had the the tidal wave that he brought to the game breaking the color barrier cannot be understated. So happy Jack and Ro- Jackie Robinson Day. Everybody's wearing number 42, as they should. Uh, it is great for the game of baseball that that door was opened up to so many more players. So I want to make sure that wish everybody a happy Jackie Robinson Day here Monday, April 15th. We are live here, Dodgers Dogs, part of the Dodgers Daily Network. It's going to be a fun show. What I want to do with today's show uh, is... I know um, Casey and Coach had a show this morning, which if you have not checked that out, please go and check that out. They kind of talk through a lot of different similar things that I'll be talking through today. I want to talk through a couple of different areas. One, we'll address some of the moves that the Dodgers are recently am, are making right now, which with the news of a Landon Knack, with the news of a Kyle Hurt, with the news of a Ricky Venasco coming on to the Dodgers. We'll be talking about that. I also want to take some time and for any of the players on this Dodgers team, in this Dodgers farm system that you have questions about or perhaps that you are concerned with, I want to actually take a little bit of a deep dive into the actual statistical outlook and see if we're seeing any sort of patterns or some reasons for optimism in any one of these guys. And there's a very specific player that we've talked about quite a bit that I think could lead some credence to maybe there's at least one bat in the bottom three of the order that you don't have to worry about quite as much as some of the other ones. Obviously, that has been a big topic of concern for a Dodgers fan recently based off of the performances that they have from the actual field results. What do the underlying metrics say? And I think this is a critical component to the game of baseball right now is there's this new analytical wave, new analytical trend of baseball. It seems like new statistics keep popping up during the game. We've seen the rise of WRC plus becoming implemented. We've seen the rise of of WOBA, which is very correlated with WRC+, plus, part of the calculation. On the pitching side, Stuff Plus has become huge. All of these different elements are part of the rise of the analytical wave of baseball. Now, what's important to know with evaluating each one of these statistics is there are some statistics that are out there that are for the on-field results. Those are kind of like the statistics that are common across the game of baseball. Like we know about batting average. We know about hits. We know about home runs, walks. Those are part of the on-field results that you get. Now, those on-field results might not often reflect the actual performance that you had as far as how well you are swinging the bat, how well you are making contact with the baseball. Perhaps there are misleading observations, especially if we get a small glimpse, a small sample size of individual players. So we're going to be taking a look at that. And even though we still have a very limited sample size so far of the Dodgers, 
I think it's important we we are into mid April. It is I don't think it's complete panic time yet, but it perhaps is time to look at some of the trends that we're seeing to start the season, make some observations and try to find different areas where players can work on skills and find potential areas of need for the Dodgers. Right now, it seems to be pitching depth right now. They seem to be running through pitchers, especially with the news that Bobby Miller is going to be missing some time on the injured list. That is not good news for the Dodgers. He was one of those arms that the Dodgers we're going to rely on for a significant portion and for good reason because Bobby Miller is an incredible talent. We've seen the absolute highs for Bobby Miller during his first outing of the 2024 campaign in Dodger Stadium. You just remember how electric the audience was when that happened. Bobby Miller, for however long it's going to be, which I think they've so far avoided the worst possible case scenario He's dealing with some sort of shoulder inflammation, as far as I know, uh, which those can be concerning if you're a pitcher because those can pop up. From the early, early reports, it sounds like they have avoided the worst case scenario with Bobby Miller, but we will wait to see. As of right now, he is not on the Dodgers 26-man roster. He is on the injured list. Same with Connor Brogdon, who they got in the trade with the Phillies for Benoni Robles. So we're going to have to decipher what's going to happen with them. Uh, They're both on the injured list, which is why we're seeing some moves for the Dodgers even right now. Just more and more things happening. Landon Neck is going to be making his big league debut coming up pretty soon. Ricky Venasco is going to be pitching in a Dodgers uniform. Those are two guys that through the course of the offseason, Casey and I have been talking about them a lot because they are incredible talents and we've been fighting for them to get opportunities. They are going to get their opportunities and we'll be able to look at some video of them as well in a few minutes, as well as somebody that Dodgers fans, us included here at Dodgers Daily, have been calling for to get him back in a Dodgers uniform because I don't think he deserves to take that uniform off. Kyle Hurt is back in Dodger Stadium. Those players, as far as 7.30 or 4.30 on Pacific time, hadn't been activated quite yet, yet we will see them get activated at some point in the future. However, this is your show, so I'm excited to be here. Dodgers Dogs, part of the Dodgers Daily Network. I want to hear what you guys have to say, so we'll go ahead and go to the comment section right now. Uh, Justin Amas, thank you very much for joining. What's up, Austin? What do you believe the plans for the starting pitching is going to the game on Wednesday? So tonight is going to be Tyler Glass now, and I think this is a game against the Washington Nationals, especially the way that the series went in San Diego. There's a couple of games there that they lost that you feel like they probably should have found a way to win at least one of those games. Definitely frustrating to lose to an in-division rival however much you think the rivalry is tonight seems to be like a game where the Dodgers need to get back on track against a Washington Nationals team who has some talented players yet the Dodgers with their level of talent should be able to handle them especially with their ace on the mound Tyler Glass now as far as Tuesday and Wednesday There hasn't been any starter announced. I believe Yoshinobu Yamamoto will be starting on Friday. And the next start would be scheduled to be Bobby Miller's place. That would have had been Tuesday or Wednesday. That is not going to be the case anymore, which means it's very likely going to be possibly Landon Knack tomorrow. I don't have this confirmed. I don't have any sort of inside information just based on the way things stand out because I think it is very likely that Wednesday is going to be a bullpen type game, possibly with a Kyle Hurt being a heavy part of that bullpen type game early. I think they're still working on building him some innings up early in the season. I don't know what exactly is going on with that. He's only gone two innings so far, which Kyle Hurt has been a starting pitcher within this organization. High, high strikeouts, big time swing and miss. Dodgers fans are so excited and have very good reason to be excited about Kyle Hurt. I think he likely, uh, and this is very early off, um, I don't have any of this confirmed, very likely could be pitching on Wednesday. 
Landon Knack could be getting his Dodgers debut tomorrow because I think Wednesday is going to be a bullpen game tonight. Tyler Glass now possibly Landon Knack tomorrow. Bullpen game on Wednesday would be my guess. Uh, so have a ton of fun at the game on Wednesday. Be sure to be cheering loud for your Los Angeles Dodgers so they can get, hopefully, a serious sweep against, against the Washington Nationals. Craig Osterberg, thank you very much for joining us. Justin Lamas. Nick Nestrini, former prospect, is making his debut for Chicago today, involved in the Lance Lynn and Joe Kelly trade. That is absolutely right. Uh, Nick Nestrini, former Dodgers prospect, guy that I got to see uh, quite a bit in 2022 when he was part of the Dodgers system in high A is going to be making his major league debut for the Chicago White Sox. That's happening, I think, right now uh, against the Kansas City Royals. So us here at Dodgers Daily, I know Nick Nick's a, uh, a good friend of us here at Dodgers Daily. Uh, we are rooting for him as he continues his journey through his professional career. Definitely somebody I think the Dodgers could use right now. However, his future as far as opportunities I think are much better for the White Sox and that journey for him at the big league level starts tonight uh just about right now so whether it's a great outing whether it's a a, no matter how the outing goes he's gonna be able to tell his kids his grandkids that he is a professional big league player uh and that is special that's something you can't take away from him so best of luck Nick uh as he continues his journey at the big league level um good evening gregory to you as well justin lamas um is talking about uh andy pajes and miguel vargas and their performances and how he believes that they would be better than a chris taylor and a gavin lux and i think there is based off of some of the early numbers that we've seen from both of them real reason to be concerned especially about a chris taylor now chris taylor is somebody that i have talked about quite a bit and defended in the past because i think he's had reason and past performances to defend he has been a valuable key contributor versatile piece for this dodgers club right now he has not been performing though and i think that I think that is obvious to any sort of Dodgers fan. We got to call it out like it is and talk about some of the numbers. If you look at some of the some of the biggest things that stand out, his strikeout percentage has jumped by 12% than what it was last year. It's at 46%, which is unsustainable unless you're hitting home runs every single other time that you're not striking out, which isn't really happening. Uh, some of the other numbers, his WOBA is only 120 Uh, expected woba is 205 that and this is we're talking about um 30 to 40 to 50 maybe plate appearances i don't remember exactly how much it is chris taylor is really struggling right now and dodgers better hope that he is able to figure it out and turn it around because they still have him under contract for next year and then i believe a mutual or club option after that so and it's not a insignificant amount of change it's they're paying him $13 million to be on the Dodgers for this year and next year. So he's struggling right now. You can't send him down to the minor leagues because he doesn't have any minor league options. So they're going to give him some run time, even though right now it is definitely ugly for a Chris Taylor. A lot of the underlying metrics right now, his max exit velo is down significantly to only about 102 um he's not barreling up the ball a whole lot just not making a lot of contact chris taylor is really struggling dodgers are going to hope that he's able to figure it out otherwise they do have some options in the minor leagues like in andy pajes and a miguel vargas who andy pajes if you haven't been paying attention a whole lot is slugging the ball incredibly well uh, 73 plate appearances this year uh, 178 wrc plus he's got five home runs already in just the 73 plate plate appearances uh he's walking a lot he's only striking out about 18 percent of the time any pajes is somebody we've talked about for quite a while he's had great performances in the past now that he's getting acclimated excuse me acclimated even more to the triple a level i fully anticipate him to continue his progression and be an impact type player for the dodgers 
The question is, if you call up an Andy Pajes, do you play him every single day or do you give him priority at bats? And I think that's why they haven't called him up and have kept a guy like a Taylor Trammell on the roster. Taylor Trammell has only gotten four plate appearances for the Dodgers during the time that he's been on this roster. They're having him there as more of the depth slash be able to fill in in the outfield as necessary. That's not the type of role that a any Pajes or Miguel Vargas need, nor are they going to develop in. So I think they are definitely on their way. And if this trend continues with a Chris Taylor, you could see very soon an Andy Pajes come up. I'm not giving any sort of timeline right now. I still think they want to make sure that they... Chris Taylor is not there before they pull the plug because they have a significant financial dedication to Chris Taylor. As far as Gavin Lux, Gavin Lux is also struggling right now. Right now, I think the biggest thing with Gavin Lux is he's just not barreling up the baseball. I think his barrel, I don't think he's had any type, any barrels yet, which if you are not, if you are unfamiliar with the baseball terminology of barrels, Uh, There is a certain combination of exit velo, how how fast the bat or the ball comes off the bat, as far as well as launch angle, the direction that the that the bat the ball comes off the bat, that has to be achieved, and it changes based off of the exit velo to count as a barrel. Gavin Lux just isn't making the solid contact needed to be able to hit for enough power to sustain what he has and he's not getting enough base hits right now to overqualify his offensive struggles and turn over the lineup over to a Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, and Freddie Freeman. So he's struggling right now. I will say defensively, I checked earlier today, Gavin Lux is at plus two outs above average. Which, if going into the season, talking about a month ago, less than a month ago, what we were probably most concerned with was the the defense of a Gavin Lux. That seems to not be a concern, at least early in the season. So, we'll have to wait and see. I think the Dodgers would still prefer and want to see a Gavin Lux succeed. Especially because a Miguel Vargas, who you had mentioned, who's doing really well with a 147 WRC plus and his 60 some plate appearances at AAA. They moved Miguel Vargas to left field to try to provide opportunities for him. I'm not anticipating Miguel Vargas to make the transition back over to second base to cover a to cover for a Gavin Lux. So you'd have to move either a Kike Hernandez there full time or a Chris Taylor, Miggy Rojas to either second base or shortstop to be able to cover for the at bats or convert Miguel Vargas back to an infielder if you want to make that transition. Right now, I think they're going to ride with Gavin Lux and hope that he's able to figure it out. Although Gavin Lux still has some minor league options, so you do have some wiggle room to play with if things continue and aren't able to improve a whole lot. So, Nando, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Couldn't they have made Michael Bush a second baseman and got rid of Gavin Lux instead? Um, I think that is a. I think it is fair to be able to look back at some of the decisions made by the Dodgers front office. I think that is totally fair, totally justifiable. With the situation with Michael Bush, and if you remember back during the off season, uh, he was somebody that we've been talking about for quite a bit because last year he put up a 150 WRC plus through the course of a full season and had continued to show progression at bats at the AAA level, which with the amount of plate appearances that Michael Bush got with that level of production, there's a high correlation with that in on-field success, on-field debuts at the major league level. And we were pushing for a Michael Bush to be able to make his debut. Dodgers didn't have priority at bats for him, nor did they have a position that they felt comfortable with Michael Bush. And so I think it's totally fair to say, what about Michael Bush at second base for the Dodgers instead of Gavin Lux? Well, if you go back to the offseason, Gavin Lux wasn't supposed to be the second baseman. He was supposed to be the shortstop, and Mookie Betts was supposed to be the second baseman, which doesn't work out a whole lot in the Dodgers' plan. It's also 
Remember through the course of the offseason with some of the concerns that a lot of Dodgers fans had about Michael Bush during his limited about the sample size that we're getting of these players through the start of the season or the start of the AAA season through the course of 80 some plate appearances. He struggled with in a Dodgers uniform last year, so there was concern about his on-field performance at the big league level. He wanted to move Mookie Betts to a second base position to where he'd feel more comfortable. He felt comfortable with the Gavin Lux, or you wanted to see Gavin Lux succeed at the shortstop position. And then you go to first base and designate hitter, which Michael Bush right now is a first baseman for the Chicago Cubs. There just wasn't a room, there wasn't room for Michael Bush, and especially at third base with Max Muncie holding it down. Max Muncie is a key and important contributor to the Dodgers. I will stand firm by that, and I think the numbers that he has and continues to produce, yes, strikes out a lot. Yes, not great defensively, although he's 30-something percentile and outs about of average at third base so far this season, maybe 28, something like that. There wasn't room for a Michael Bush, and I don't believe in holding guys down at the minor league level forever. And with Michael Bush right now, he is having tremendous success with the opportunity that he has. It's because I believe he's getting consistent at bats for the Chicago Cubs every single day. So he's able to learn. He's able to adapt to that level. And right now he is on an incredible tear, an incredible hot streak, homeward in four straight days for the Chicago Cubs. You would obviously love to have that if you were the Dodgers and the Dodgers did have that. And there is concern that the Dodgers will lose that trade. Yet, they weren't going to give him the necessary opportunity that he had to grow into that type of player at the big league level. They might have given him inconsistent at-bats. So, I think it's easy to go back and see the results that he's having, the incredible success. Yet, we often forget about the situation on which it occurred and why the Dodgers made the decisions that they did. Um, and the Dodgers got two really good players that are going to be working their way through the minor league system, uh, and Zaire Hope, who's at Rancho, and Jackson Ferris, who is at High A. So, two really good talents. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Michael Bush is doing phenomenal for Chicago Cubs. Wish him nothing but the best over there. Justin Lamas, Chris Taylor is going to strike out 42 times tonight in honor of Jackie Robinson. I would actually be super impressed if that happens because that means that the Dodgers got Chris Taylor up to plate 42 times. You got to score an incredible amount of runs and hope there, there's a bunch of drop third strikes. So you're not giving up that many runs as well. Uh, pretty good one. Uh, uh, pretty good roast to Chris Taylor. Hope that he's able to perform. Craig Osterberg, Ricky Venasco, Kyle Hurt and Landon Knack at Dodger Stadium, who goes down? That is a great question, and this seems to be the ever-ending question of what's going on with the Dodgers bullpen, the roller coaster, or the train that's going on for the Dodgers from Oklahoma City to Los Angeles and back again. We saw that in the Beal Chris match. We saw that with the Denelson Lamette, with them coming up and being sent down, designated for assignment, making their way back to Oklahoma City. As far as the guys that are going to be going down, I haven't seen any sort of transactions, so this would be just projection based off of guesses that I have. And if something has been reported during the last couple of minutes, please let us let me know in the comments section. Uh, and we'll have to wait. I'll have to make that observation. But as far as the guys on the roster, as far as different possibilities that they could uh, take over, you're talking about some of the relievers. So you're talking about guys potentially like a JP Fire Eisen who really did struggle and has struggled pretty mightily for the Dodgers during the course of the season so far. Just hasn't been able to perform. Uh, I think the Dodgers still believe in him enough, yet the on-field product, the on-field success still has to be there. Uh, I think you could see him potentially going down, especially because he pitched recently. You could potentially see a Nick Ramirez being sent down because he pitched recently as well. Look for some of those guys who uh, pitch recently, have some of those options, and then they decide to go ahead and move them down. I don't think they're ready to 
pull the plug per se on an Alex Vesiel, though he is an option and does have a minor league option to be able to utilize. So perhaps you see him, especially because he did pitch 21 pitches on Sunday. And you look at some of the underlying metrics, the FIP and XFIP are not quite there for an Alex Vesia. I think they still want him in there to be a left-handed reliever, left-handed pitcher. We'll have to wait and see. I don't know exactly what the moves are. And then it's possible that you could see a Ricky Venasco taking the place and then a Landon Knack taking the place for him. Uh, Some of the maneuvers that the Dodgers decide to do, um, not saying that that is the best as far as the long-term help their development of these players, but this is the moves that the Dodgers tend to make uh, for, so we'll have to wait and see what happens with the moves that they make. Chris Faborg, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and Gregory is joining us as well. Uh, Nando, Chris Taylor is worse than Austin Barnes. How is that possible? Um, yeah, I don't know what exactly is going on. It has been disappointing the production level of Chris Taylor. Yet, I think his track record still provides a little bit of optimism. Yet, we got to see the on-field performances. But it's been a pleasant surprise. I think Austin Barnes has a WRC plus of 133 during his couple of games that he's been in there. I don't know if many of you in the comments section would have predicted that during the course of the offseason where it was uh, get rid of Austin Barnes. Now, during the short sample size that he's had, he's been producing. So, that's been... Uh, kind of funny to watch and good for Austin Barnes as well, who is a clubhouse leader on this club. Kreo Kosterberg, Pajas, and Vargas should be given their shot since the bottom of the lineup can't hit. Um, I think this brings up a really important point and somebody that I want to highlight. So we have a concern as far as the Dodgers in the bottom of the lineup. And I don't, I don't think there's No doubt about that. I saw some of the statistics looking at the OPS of the Dodgers' top three. Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, Shohei Otani being phenomenal. Then you have that middle section of a Will Smith, Teoscar Hernandez, Max Muncy, who are good, solid professional hitters. And then the bottom of the lineup where it's a little bit of a struggle to say the least. We've seen Kike Hernandez struggle, have a 25 WRC+. We have Chris Taylor obviously struggling a lot. Miggy Rojas, who's not the offensive force uh, with the bat. Uh, and Austin Barnes sometimes at the catcher. And then that brings us to James Outman. I'm going to give you some reason to be optimistic about James Outman. Now, to be fair, James Outman, friend of the program, has appeared on this show. That's not why I'm being optimistic about a James Outman, although... I have watched James Outman perform in the past, and he, I, I love the player that is James Outman. But I want to take a look at something really important. And I'm going to go ahead and actually share my screen right here um, to a page that I know you guys probably are familiar with, Baseball Savant. Now, Baseball Savant, if you are unfamiliar with, a uh, phenomenal tool to utilize during the course of the season to be able to see the impact in different types of players. So when you look at James Altman's baseball savant numbers, they don't look great. I don't think they're overwhelming, yet there are a couple of key aspects that I want to take a look at, and they have to do with this section down here, which has to do with some of the stat cast batting right here. And I want you to see the similarities between 2023, which was James Outman, a four-war type player, a really good offensive piece, and 2024 James Outman, because I think this can actually lead to a little bit of optimism, even though we've seen James Outman only put up a 71 WRC+. plus. Uh, so I want you to take a look at some of the numbers. So let's go ahead and start with some of the similarities. Let's look at the average exit velo, 2023. 87.9, 2024, 88.1. Max exit velo, about the same at about 111-ish. You look at the launch angle, that's decreased a little bit. Sweet spots percentage, he's barreling up a little bit, or getting on the sweet spot, I should say, a little bit more. Let's look at some of the expected numbers. And the reason why I think this is significant is because 
Yes, the on-field results haven't been there, yet I believe the expected numbers are a better indication of future possible success. So you look at his expected batting average, basically the exact same as 2023. His expected slugging percentage, basically the exact same as 2023. His WOBA, which is based off of on-field results, has decreased significantly, yet his expected weighted on-base average is it basically the exact same as 2023. Now, you could say that there was going to be regression because his expected WOBA was lower than his actual WOBA in 2023, Yet the batted ball data that we have so far on James Altman is still pretty much the exact same as what we saw. Same with expected weighted batting average, weighted expected WOBA on contact. Pretty much the exact same hard pay percentage, strikeout and walk percentage. All of these are very similar. Now that's not to say that James Altman is performing right now. I'm not saying that. I still think that James Allen still has a lot left to prove. And obviously, the expected results have to follow with the actual results. But what this is to show is that there are underlying metrics based off of the way that he is hitting the baseball that seem to indicate over the course of a larger sample size that he can and probably will be able to find the pieces necessary to have a productive season similar, maybe not exactly the same to what he had in 2020, 2023, which 2023 James Altman, I think we can pretty much all agree was a phenomenal big league player. Uh, a lot of the underlying metrics are still there. Then you look at some of the other underlying metrics, his batting average on balls in play right now is 219 significantly lower than the league average that usually corrects itself all of this is to say that there are possible reasons to be optimistic about james outman as a player yes i know he hasn't fully been performing quite yet yet some of the other metrics indicate that he should be just fine so um that is something that i want to point out that is something that uh it's not doomsday kind of talk or saying call up Andy Pies instead of a James Altman because I think a lot of the underlying metrics indicate that he is going to be just fine. We'll have to wait and see though. Obviously, the on-field results have to match with the expected results that he is doing right now. So that is kind of my spiel on James Altman. Uh if you guys disagree with me, please let me know down in the comment section as well. And I'd be happy to uh, go ahead and engage with that. So um, Nando is concerned about the injury with Bobby Miller as far as what that could be. As And we'll have to wait and see what happens with Bobby Miller. I don't know exactly what the injury is going to be. Obviously, there is some discouraging news as far as the injury with an Emmett Sheehan who's going to be missing even more time. I don't know exactly what's going to happen with him. Wish him nothing but the best because when he is on the field, he is phenomenal and has incredible talent. And I think he's going to come back hungrier and better than ever. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Chris Fabar, Glass now versus National somehow doesn't seem fair. We'll have to wait and see. That's why they play the games as the uh, phrase goes. So we'll have to see if the on-field result takes place. Um, Roy Calhoun, thank you very much for joining us. Glass now is about to be the NL Cy Young in 2024. That is the hope. And the hope is you're able to get Tyler Glass now uh, through the season. And hopefully you don't have to deal with a whole lot of injuries if you're the Dodgers. The on-field results with Tyler Glass now are phenomenal. All of the metrics back it up. The Velo absolutely is there. All of the Sierra, uh, the expected FIP, the FIP are phenomenal. All of the results absolutely are there for Tyler Glass now. And if he keeps it up as he has been and the Dodgers are successful, I think there's a very good chance that he could be the 2024 National League Cy Young Award winner. So that'd be really cool. Uh, Gregory is reminding you, if you haven't already, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe if you are new. Uh, would really appreciate it and would really help with the growth of this channel. 
Uh, so if you haven't already, be sure to uh, check out Dodgers Daily, all of the great content that we have, including some different player type interviews. I know we've had some players like Landon Neck and a uh, whole bunch of different players be able to join on. And we have different features on guys like Landon Neck, Ricky Venasco, Kyle Hurt that are all going to be called up and going to be on this Dodgers roster within the next couple of days if their reports are correct. Uh, so be sure to tune in to that. I'm incredibly, incredibly excited about that. And I think the... Um, I'm just excited about the journey that these guys are going on and the opportunity to make a difference, not just for the Dodgers, but for their family lives as well. I think this is generational impacting for these guys. Often we don't take a look at the human element of it. But then also looking at the Dodgers element, a guy like Landon Knack, who's been pitching this year for the Oklahoma City Baseball Club, has three outings for them, pitched pretty well. I think an important thing about Landon Knack, what he's done, each one of his outings, he's gone at least five innings, which with the Dodgers right now and how taxing it has been for the bullpen, which has required this up and down trade a lot with Oklahoma City, he is going to be a guy, hopefully, that is able to provide innings for the Dodgers that they desperately need, and that's going to be really cool. And then a guy like Ricky Venasco, who came over from Texas, from the Texas Rangers last year, and has been fighting for opportunities at the big league level, designated for assignment, got picked up, designated for assignment again. The dream is going to become a reality and the opportunity to showcase his skills is going to be there. And he's got nasty stuff, high velo, nasty breaking balls. Ricky Venasco is going to be fun to watch and see the development that he continues to have. And then, of course, everybody knows about Kyle Hurt about now and his incredible swing and miss stuff. The demeanor that he has on the mound. It is absolutely phenomenal what he is able to do. So... Uh, excited to see him back in a Dodgers uniform. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Thailand. Uh, sadly, agree with Justin Lamas uh, about the strikeouts for Chris Taylor and some of the concerns that they have. Uh, go ahead and take care of the Nationals. And that's absolutely right. You can't underestimate, as, as I think the Washington Nationals aren't, as great of a baseball club as the Los Angeles Dodgers, just to say it nicely, or it doesn't have quite the level of talent. You have to go out, play the game, and you have to win the games because you could very well see yourself in a situation where you lose to teams that you shouldn't. Dodgers got to go out there and perform, especially the way that the last series went and ended. So it's going to be good to see. Michael also says 42 forever, and that's absolutely right. And that brings up the Damino. Thank you very much for joining us, Damino. Says, happy Jackie Robinson Day. Said this at the beginning of the program. Happy Jackie Robinson Day to you, to everybody, the impact that he had on the game of baseball and in the culture of the United States and around the world can't be overestimated. It is absolutely huge impact that he had. So we're internally grateful what what he was able to do in breaking the color barrier, uh, which allowed for the opportunity for so many great baseball players to be able to get into the game. I think that is absolutely huge and wonderful an exciting achievement uh, with the game of baseball. Uh, he also says, just finishing up work shift. I'll be around longer in a bit. We'll have to wait and see you in a little bit, Damino. Gardner Russell, thank you very much for joining us. Chris Taylor was on the decline last year. He's picked up right where he left off. They should just release him. He had plenty of time to figure it out. We'll have to wait and see with Chris Taylor. I don't think that is something that the Dodgers are going to do immediately, especially because I think it is easy to remember that it is April 15th and this is something that it is early in the season and Chris Taylor has been a good solid player in the past. And we've seen month performances for great players where they've put up poor performances. That's not to say that Chris Taylor will figure it out necessarily a lot of the underlying metrics are not pretty for him especially because he's not making contact and striking out almost 50 percent of the time dodgers aren't going to make that call until maybe 
mid to late May, June at the earliest, especially with the financial incentives that they have, they're going to give Chris Taylor a significant portion of time. So right now, I think the best opportunity, because you want the Dodgers to win games late April, early May, hopefully Chris Taylor is able to figure it out. Dodgers will give him time too, and they will be sure that there's nothing left of Chris Taylor before they decide to move on from him. If they decide to do that, which I am not anticipating the Dodgers to do at this moment, but we'll have to wait to see. And yes, Matty Man 5 Dodge, a little bit of a struggle is a little bit of an understatement, but I also like to be optimistic on this show. I think there is a lot of failure in the game of baseball. And I believe if you have that mindset of failure, I think you're going to miss or you're not going to be in the correct mindset to be able to succeed. I think that is something that this Dodgers organization as a whole emulates or preaches. And that is something we at Dodgers Daily, because we want to try to represent the Dodgers culture as best as we can, because we've been surrounded at least a little bit by some of the culture at the minor league level. That is something that we want to emulate. So that positive-ish type, but with a little dose of reality as well. Uh, Nature that we have here at Dodgers Daily is something that we will continue to have uh, here. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Uh, And I think it's really important to take notice that the expected statistics are a real thing and are something that very well look at the exit velos. They look at how hard the uh, base the ball was hit off the bat, the launch angles. They take into account a whole variety of different factors that the actual on-field result doesn't take into account. And very often, those type of measures, those type of statistics, are better predictors of future success than a individual's actual performances on the field. Not always. Obviously, predicting future success is incredibly difficult. Otherwise, Dodgers would know who to sign and they throw a billion dollars at those type of players, which they threw a billion dollars, but they throw another billion dollars to guaranteed success. Baseball and life in general is so difficult to predict, yet there are different statistics that are intended to be a little bit better and intended to reflect a little bit better the nature of the quality of contact. That is what the expected statistics are intended to do. And that's oh, those are some of the statistics that show that James Altman could be a little bit better performing or more in line with his past performance in 2023 than the actual results on the field during the small sample size that we have so far in 2024. So... Based off of those results, I am anticipating James Outman to be hitting better throughout the course of the season, especially if he can, continues to have similar quality contact. I think we've seen quite a few times some really hard hit balls get lined out for outs, some unlucky hits, some high expected batting average get end up in the glove of a defender. So I think some of those will turn into I think that some of those outs will turn into hits and a lot of this will correct itself for James Altman. So I'm not ready to give up on him quite a bit. And I think this is the language that not just I am using, but this is the language that a lot of the front offices are using because I think these are the better measures for future success. So because those are what the front offices are using as best as to my knowledge, That is what I'm going to use, and that's what I'm going to look for for the future and try to be optimistic about these guys going forward. So appreciate the comments, Matty Man 5 Dodge. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us. Question, do we need to do some changes to the batting order? I don't believe so right now. I guess the question would be what sort of changes would they do? Um, Towards the bottom of the lineup, obviously, there has been quite a bit of struggle with them and I think that just has to do with the on-field results I don't think there's a whole lot of mixing up that you can do because they're at the bottom of the lineup they're getting fewer at bats uh that's kind of when players are struggling you would prefer the players that are hitting well to get more at bats 
Uh, I think the top three is totally fine, although Freddie Freeman hasn't been hitting to the nature of what he can and should be hitting. I think all of that is going to turn around. He is an absolute professional in the game of baseball. Hall of Fame level player. I think he's going to be able to figure that out very soon. With the middle three as potentially where you could mix some things up, I'm still happy with a Will Smith. Uh, and then you can kind of mix and match with the Max Muncy, Teoscar Hernandez, James Outman. The only concern that you could possibly have about that is you are having three different guys that are high strikeout guys, guys that have 30% or around 30% strikeout percentage consistently all three in a row, which could lead to some drive killers, uh, some potentially run scoring opportunities that could really kill that. And especially because we've seen, uh, for example, like a Max Muncy struggle with runners in scoring position with only, a, I believe, 36 WRC plus in those opportunities. There potentially could be some room to mix up those hitters in the order, but then you also have to keep in mind the lefty-righty split because I think the Dodgers are going to go up against a lot of left-handed relief pitchers, and you don't want to have too many left-handed hitters in a row to be able to combat that uh, later in games. You want to be able to have that matchup in your favor, favor as well. So it's an interesting conversation to have as far as the batting order for the Dodgers. One that I don't have too strong of an emotional opinion on or too strong of an analytical opinion on. But I know that it's something that the Dodgers are going to mix and match what should and can be done to make sure that they are maximizing the run scoring opportunities for this club. I think still think this club, this, club, this offense is great this offense has performed there's been opportunities that they have missed although that is something that every single team is going to do right now they have some hitters that are struggling i think that is the biggest thing about this offense to be able to make it so that it is the best possible offense that it can be getting some of those hitters to perform to the levels that they can be and we'll have to wait and see from there. The Dodgers are going to do whatever they can to be able to have the best club. And I think this is something that is important to keep in mind. We didn't anticipate Bobby Miller going down with an injury, nor do we know how long that is going to last. I'm not expecting or hoping that it's going to last too terribly long. But that also means that this that could be a potential area of need for the Dodgers, especially if he's going to miss a significant portion of time. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Injuries, struggles can pop up out of nowhere. And it's a good thing that the Dodgers have some really talented players within this farm system who have been performing incredibly well to either call up or be able to use in potential trade packages. Guys like in any Pajes has been performing phenomenally with, along with Miguel Vargas. Guys at the l younger level, we saw Dalton Rushing be able to hit for a couple of home runs. Almost hit a walk-off home run for Tulsa. Was about a couple feet away from doing so. Hit it in the deepest part of One Oak Field in Tulsa. Uh, the game on, I believe it was Friday night. We've seen some other really good performances offensively. Uh, Taylor Young is performing really well. Zaire Hope hit three home runs. There was great breakout performances that I'll talk about later in the show with the Great Lakes Loons and their breakout performances against the Lansing Lugnuts. This offense and this system is good, and this is why the Dodgers went out and instead of going out and trading for major league pieces for all of the guys that they didn't have room for at the major league level, like a Michael Bush, like a Manny Margot, who they decided to have Kike Hernandez over Manny Margot. For a lot of these guys, they decided to trade them for minor league depth. And that minor league depth, especially with the level of talent that they got, could bear fruit, especially if they need to make some type of trade, which right now, this is an imperfect club. They will figure it out and they will find whatever ways that they can to either take the guys that they have in-house to be able to elevate them to be consistent performers and to the level to where they can rely on them at the playoffs, or they're going to find guys from outside the system who reach that level of talent, which 
It's important to remember that a lot of these positions are volatile, like we talked a lot about. The bullpen is really struggling right now. Yet we've seen other relievers that we've talked about quite a bit struggle. The three relief pitchers, left-handed, Nardi, uh, Tanner Scott, A.J. Puck, who's now the starter. A lot of them are struggling right now for the Miami Marlins, who Marlins are having a really rough time in the National League East. A lot of these pitchers, it can be difficult to predict. And I think the game of baseball is so incredibly difficult to predict. The Dodgers have a lot of pieces to be able to use to maximize their club and maximize the opportunity. They will take advantage of that. This club that you see on April 15th, 2024 will not be entering October the exact same way. They will get healthy. They will get guys back. And if guys go down with injury, they will find ways to be able to help improve this club because this club is all in and they will do whatever they can to win a World Series. So, uh, Jordan, thank you very much for joining us as well. Uh, Excited to see you be part of the chat here. Dodgers Dogs, part of the Dodgers Daily Network. Um, Obviously, people are not too happy at Chris Taylor right now, and I think that is totally fair. Uh, I'm rooting for him, and I think his track record backs up that he can be a good player, but we're going to have to see it on the field right now. Uh, Good evening, Sammy Boy, and good evening to Roy Estrada as well. Really happy that you guys have joined us here, Dodgers Dogs. Uh, Gregory, is there any updates on Walker Buehler's hand that got line drived? Um, Yeah, so if you didn't get a chance to see Walker Buehler, there was a comeback to Walker Buehler, hit him in the hand. From the outlooks of things, it seems like Walker Buehler is going to be okay. He's going to be fine. He is anticipating, has stated that he's going to make a start on, I believe it's Thursday, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens with Walker Buehler. I'm still expecting him to be fine. I know everybody kind of freaked out a little bit what's going to happen with Walker Buehler, but I think he's going to be just fine. So, uh, I, he's going to make a re- another rehab start, I believe, in Oklahoma City, if not Rancho, one of those two clubs as well. Um, Roy Estrada says top half of the lineup, even with Freddie, in a little bit of a slump. A little bit, uh, and this happens through the course of the season. We see a little bit of up and ups and downs. Obviously, I don't think Mookie bets with the first portion of the season with how incredibly high that he was on the offensive side, uh, how well he was doing is what I mean. Uh, He was doing incredibly well, Mookie Betts, and the level that he was hitting at, I don't believe was as sustainable. Uh, But I think he is still an incredible piece to this lineup. I still think this offense has an insane amount of talent, and they're going to be able to figure things out. It is a long 162 season 162 game season it is a marathon it is not a sprint and we have to take that into account when we're evaluating these players uh as we go through the course of the season so um jamie thank you very much for joining us uh here dodgers dogs part of the dodgers daily network uh hope you're doing well uh out there in i believe pennsylvania is i think is where you're at uh, good to see you back here, part of the Dodgers Daily Network here on Dodgers Dogs. Uh, hope everything is well over there. Uh, Roy Estrada, 1-5, to five, is dominant, including Tay Oscar, uh, not Muncy, carrying team, fix our pitching to hold leads, and we will win World Series. Make the hard calls front office, bring up Vargas and Pajé. So I guess the question that I have for you is who would you have any Pajés and a Miguel Vargas replace, and especially with a Miguel Vargas going to left field, what are some of the at-bats, what are some of the consistent at-bats that you would see for them? And I'm still on the, and I know this might not be fully the popular opinion, uh, I'm still on the Max Muncy is a good, solid player uh, type of train, and I think his numbers, even though he is striking out at 37%, that is dropped down from the 45%. I think that will continue to drop down for him as we go through the course of the season and adjust to some of the career norms. I also don't think he has been too terribly, uh, although he hasn't been great on the defensive side. The 
outs above average metrics aren't grading out as harshly as perhaps we always assume of a Max Muncy, uh, still not performing in incredibly well defensively but so far max muncie has had a 122 wrc plus and has been worth during the very limited time that we've seen 0.5 war uh he's hitting 246 342 492 as four home runs we've seen him come up in some clutch moments to be able to hit for a home run i'm still on board with a max muncie i know not everybody is We'll have to wait and see, and we can have that disagreement back and forth. But that would be my question, is who would you replace Andy Pajes and a Miguel Vargas with uh, at the Dodgers big league level on the Dodgers roster? And are you willing to cut ties this early in the season with a perhaps a Chris Taylor, perhaps a, well, Taylor Trammell, but then are you going to provide opportunities for them to be able to get consistent at bat? So we'll have to wait and see. Great conversation to be had at the Dodgers. Always here on Dodgers Dogs. Love the conversation that we have. Um, the Damino Ty Adcock got picked up by Detroit today. I did not get a chance to see that. Uh, I'll have to look at that afterwards. Uh, what is your grade for Dave Roberts so far? Um, that's a really good question, and I don't, I don't dive too deep into the day-to-day -day managerial decisions and the frustrations that I know a lot of Dodgers fans have of Dave Roberts. I think he's dealt with some things, some different injuries. There's been some situations where you don't really want to see some of these pitchers go out there. I don't know how much of that is Dave Roberts' call, how much of that has to do with the lack of health of injuries. So uh, I'm going to, and this is not a this is probably not going to be a popular one. I'm going to go ahead and pass on the Dave Roberts grade and call it incomplete right now. I'm still, I still think Dave Roberts with what he's able to do is a fine manager. Uh, he's going to have to be able to perform in the postseason. So the during the course of the regular season, I think the Dodgers are going to be fine. They're going to make the playoffs. It is the course of with Dave Roberts, what he's going to be able to do in the postseason. That's going to justify the grade that he has. So all of the, in-season struggles that we might be seeing right now are less significant per se than what's going to happen in the postseason which might not be completely fair but that is the expectation of the Dodgers and that is something that we want to be able to see for the Dodgers uh, to be able to see them actually be able to perform in the postseason so uh Roy Estrada saying that Kyle Hurt was activated and on the roster. I haven't seen, uh, but I also haven't been on Twitter. I haven't been on X recently. The actual activation for Kyle Hurt. But if that is true, which there has been a lot of reports that he will be activated, absolutely well-deserved. And he, he definitely needs to be on this roster. He is too good and too talented to be stuck in Oklahoma City all season. So I couldn't be more excited to see Kyle Hurt be a part of this roster. Um, Roy Estrada is also saying what he would do to uh, make the trade, make the decision to call up a Vargas and Pajes, eat the CT3 contract, replace with Pajes, designate for assignment Trammell, and bring up Vargas. Uh, and I think that is totally fair to be able to make those assessments, to be able to make those adjustments at the big league level because you would still have a Miggy Rojas that would be able to back up the infield and a Kike Hernandez. So you wouldn't necessarily be concerned about the platooning split. Uh, the question is, are you willing to give up on CT3 with less than a month of a sample size for him? Uh, that can be your opinion. And I don't think that is something that the Dodgers are going to do. But based off the way that he is performing on the field right now, I think that is totally fair to be able to come to that type of decision, especially with the performance that Andy Pajes is putting on so far, which has been absolutely incredible. Uh, designate for assignment Trammell and Brina Vargas. I think Trammell is just filling in the role for a just being on the bench while Jason Hayward is still spending some time on the injured list. Right now, they aren't giving him really much of any at bat. So we'll have to, um, with a Taylor Trammell, or do you want a Miguel Vargas to be called up 
and then just sit on the bench every single day. Would that be best for the development? Would we get the best for Miguel Vargas? Perhaps that is the only opportunity that you see with him at the Dodgers at the big league level. I'm not anticipating Taylor Trammell, for, who probably is an incredible guy and a good, solid baseball player. I just don't see the future for him for the Dodgers, so I could see that at some point. My anticipation, though, is that being the delay to have somebody on this roster as they wait for Jason Hayward to come back. Uh, Damon O says, Pa Hayes is awesome. I can't wait to see him on the major league roster. That is absolutely correct. And I think that's the sentiment of a lot of Dodgers fans and a lot of people around the game of baseball is the anticipation of the arrival of Andy Pa Hayes with the power that he brings with the clutch arm and the clutch nature of baseball that he has. I showed it a month or two ago on the show, the home run that he had September 12th, 2021. And that is after a 450 foot home run to dead straight center field, second home run on the day, but in a clutch moment that Andy Pajes had, it is phenomenal of what he is able to do. And I think he is a great, great baseball player and he's going to do Absolutely tremendous things for the Dodgers. Once he gets called up to the big league level, we'll have to wait and see. Still has very limited appearances in AAA, yet with his performances that he's had on the field, deserves a call up at some point. Justin Lamas is heading out for the night. Got to hit the road. Uh, best of luck to you and have fun at the game on Wednesday. Uh, King Yellowman, thank you very much for joining us as well. So a lot of really good discussion, a lot of interesting conversation around the game of baseball, around the game of the Los Angeles Dodgers is concerned. And if anybody has any additional questions or any additional things that they want to look at uh, with as far as the statistical output of the Los Angeles Dodgers, this would be a great opportunity to be able to enter into the comment section to be able to do that. But now I want to take some time because I didn't get a chance to watch every single minute of the action. I had to listen to some of the games of the Dodgers. Uh, that's because I got a, the opportunity to be able to go to Lansing, Michigan to be able to watch the high A affiliate of the Dodgers. This is, if you are unfamiliar with myself, uh, something that... I get to do and the action that I get to see up close and personal. I'm not from California. I've never been to the state of California or Los Angeles, never been to a Dodgers game, but I get a chance to experience the culture with the high A affiliate of the Dodgers, the Great Lakes Loons. And it was a great week. There were some great performances. Casey's actually been posting about it quite a bit today on his Twitter at Dodger underscore daily. Go check out the post or go check out the uh, tweets that he's had or the post, I guess, whether they're called now. There's been some really cool breakout performances that we've seen uh, during this past week. And we got to see at the high A level some of the players that perhaps you might have forgotten about really break out and step up in quite a big way during this week, including one guy that I want to highlight right now. A uh, guy who is a top international prospect in the Dodgers system. We'll get some video of him from Twitter pulled up in just a second. Uh, that is Luis Rodriguez. Do you guys remember Luis Rodriguez and the hype that he had for this Dodgers system? He's had some really good performances, and he is performing incredibly well. Had a week where he had six, seven, eight hits. Uh, it seemed like every single time that he had went up to the bat, had a plate appearance, he was just out there putting the barrel on the ball, uh, getting some base hits, and hitting for some power, too. You can see the opposite field home run. You can see the double that he had onto the gap. Luis Rodriguez, a forgotten outfield prospect, top international free agent, starting to see some of the potential, perhaps, and you can see this one, he went opposite field. This one, he pulled the ball. Really cool to see Luis Rodriguez hit for some power and be able to get some on base. So I got to see them really perform through the course of the week. So that was really cool to see. 
Luis Rodriguez to be able to perform. So we're going to go through a couple of these performances that I want to highlight, including the it's good to see some of the power potential uh, on display for a guy like a Chris Newell, who you can see this one, he just hit a bald center field. Um, Chris Newell is a guy with an incredible amount of talent with a really sweet swing outfielder in the Dodgers system, performed incredibly well in Rancho in 2023, came off the Great Lakes and performed. You can see the power that he had on this home run, hitting it over the tall wall in right field. Chris Newell, when he makes contact, does damage. And I know there's a little bit of swing and miss in his swing, but Chris Newell is an outfield bat and a name that you should know because the exit velos are great and the power that he has is absolutely phenomenal and he is a name to watch within this Dodgers system. So there's Chris Newell, there is Luis Rodriguez, and this really was an offensive breakout during the course of the weekend for the Loons. And these are just some names that of great performances that you should take note of. Uh, there was a Kyle Nevin, uh, son of Phil Nevin, had a really good week. There was Dylan Campbell, who had an opposite field home run, performed really well. Jordan Thompson from LSU had a great week. You got to see Noah Miller be able to launch a home run. And you got to see the return of Alex Freeland to the high A level. Uh, Alex Freeland was in Great Lakes all of 2023. He has returned in 2024, and he's returned with a vengeance. He has five games that he's played, kind of going between third and short. He's already walked seven times. His plate, his plate discipline is elite. In addition to his ability to hit for power, to be able to hit for drives, base hits, get on base, he has performed really well at the start of this season, 2024, which has been great to see. Uh, as well as some of the pitching performances, I'll just go ahead and describe these really quick. want to give a shout out. Uh, Jared Karros and Peter Hubeck are going out there and performing just like they did through the past in 2023, towards the end of the season, when both of them piggybacked to beat Jackson Job twice within the span of the week, then also won a playoff appearance. They're both performing really, 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 really well. Uh, Christian Romero pitched incredibly well yesterday, getting some swing and miss, some strikeouts, as well as some ground balls. Uh, for the, as well as the relief staff, I want to give some highlights to a Kelvin Bautista and a Kelvin Ramirez out of the bullpen, two guys that I wasn't familiar with going into the season. They are both shutting down hitters so far at the high A level. And then there's something different that I've noticed early this season about Lucas Webb. And this is something that was evident during his time in Rancho in 2023. The look in his eyes is different. The ability to get hitters out is different. And this is something that Casey highlighted on the show. I believe it was on Saturday. He is performing incredibly well. Christian Suarez, Jermaine Rosario, some names that you need to be familiar with. Just want to give a shout out to that. Loons took four out of six in Lansing, and they are once again in first place in the Midwest League East Division, something that I take notice of, something that is important because winning is important to the development of these players, something that is preached by the coaches and the player development staff at this level. Definitely something to keep an eye out for at the Great Lakes Loons level. We'll be talking a little bit more about this. I believe tomorrow Casey and I are planning on doing a show with a little bit more highlights from the minor league level so you get to see some of the action from over the weekend and some anticipation going forward as well as the action that's going to be happening tonight with the Dodgers and Nationals. Uh, I'm going to get a drink really quick. Uh, Damon L says, I got to watch 42 today and I hope it's streaming somewhere that I have. Uh, yeah, no, definitely happy Jack and Jackie Robinson Day to you all. Uh, and it is just great for the game of baseball and great for the culture that he lived the life that he did, that he had the temperament, the character, uh, and that there was a real fight for justice for the game of baseball. That was definitely amazing to watch. Roy Estrada, how do we fix our pitching, both starters and relievers? Um, really good question. We'll have to 
wait to see. First off, the biggest thing right now for the Dodgers is to keep as many pitchers healthy as they possibly can. We've seen a large, large majority of or a large portion of pitchers go down with injuries, and that has been the biggest biggest thing that has hurt the Dodgers right now. Why we're seeing such an influx of relief pitchers come up from Oklahoma City and designated for assignment. Because the Dodgers don't have a Blake Trinan, they don't have a Bruce Dar Gretel to rely upon in and out of the bullpen. Getting those guys healthy is going to be huge. We'll have to see what happens when a Walker Buehler is and will come back for this Dodgers club. The biggest thing is going to be the health of the club. As far as the on-field performances, some of the tweaks and stuff, I don't have the exact specifics of what they're able to do, nor am I a pitching coach. That's why they have Mark Pryor in the pitching lab. That's why they have at the development side, Dave Anderson, Richard De Los Santos, uh, all of the great pitching coaches to be able to help with the development of these guys. I will say there is some encouraging things like the uh, FIP and XFIP of guys like a Yamamoto and guys like a Gavin Stone, who I know his ERA is inflated, although he had a great performance on Sunday, or not Sunday, on Saturday. Really amazing to see, and there's some reason to believe that their ERA isn't reflected of what it will be going forward in the future. Um I think it's going to be primarily about health right now during this first wave, this first punch of the season. And as guys get healthy, then you can take an evaluation of where guys are at from there. Uh, that's the best as I can do right now. Uh, Damon L says, Noah Miller is an incredible, such a great pickup for the Dodgers. Yes, it, it absolutely was. And I think especially this is, these are some of the things that don't get reflected in the numbers, yet you get to appreciate on the field, the defensive ability that Noel Miller has is absolutely phenomenal. He's had a couple of really tough short hops that he's done and picked them out from the ground like it was nothing. There's been some really tough plays that he made, double plays that he's made. Um, all across the Loons defense so far this season, Alex Freeland is reliably consistent at third and at short. Jordan Thompson has bounced between second base and third base and has performed well. Sam Mongelli has performed really well defensively. There's a lot of good defensive reasons to be encouraged by them. And then Noel Miller has been really good, solid, really good at the plate discipline side, has hit the home run, and has been solid offensively. And that type of combination leads to a shortstop prospect that you can say, huh, this guy has something in there. Same with a Trey Sweeney who's performed well, and you can say, huh, this guy's got something in there. Then the lack of depth that the Dodgers had at shortstop going into this season, you start to see some real depth and some real fruit being to bear for the Dodgers in this farm system, which is really cool. Uh, Sammy Boy says the relievers will work themselves out. I'm confident of that. Injuries is what I'm scared of. That's what I'm scared of so far is the uh, injuries that the pitching staff deals with because we know that it will happen. The question is when and who. It's kind of like a ticking time bomb. Never know what exactly is going to happen. And when those, those waves, those struggles come, Dodgers will find a way. I have no doubt about that. I think they have built up some greats through the course of the offseason that they had, and I think they're a bit more uh, they're a bit more aggressive with their pursuit of players and their pursuit of a championship this year, and there's something different. Uh, Chris Fraborg says, yay, loons, as absolutely right. Let's go, loons. Nando says, the Cubs won the Michael Bush trade, should have put Bush at second base. I think that's a fair opinion to have with how good Michael Bush is performing. But don't give up uh, Jackson Ferris and Zaire Hope. Both players are incredibly talented players. Um, there also was not an opportunity for Michael Bush for the Dodgers at the big league level. And I don't think the Dodgers were going to put Michael Bush at second base uh, because of some of the defensive concerns that they had with him. 
Tamali, thank you very much for joining us. I've caught a few Loons games, and I don't think last year's group could be topped, but this group has the potential to. Lorenzo starts hitting bombs, and they'll have a complete team. Yeah, and this Loons club right now, I think you look through the course. I was doing some of the numbers earlier. I think they, as a team, have about a 115 WRC plus this early in the season at the Midwest League level, and that is with Tyrone Lorenzo friend of the program, really struggling to start the season. As soon as he gets back on track, which he was the Dodgers leader in WRC Plus last season in 2023, once he starts hitting bombs, once he starts hitting for power, being able to make more consistent contact, this team will be a complete club. Obviously, 2023, the team that's pretty much there at Tulsa is special. And I have... I really hope that club is able to finish the story and win the championship that they came one, one, one run short of in Cedar Rapids. That team is going to be very difficult to complete. I hope they finish the story. I hope the Loons are able to finish the story with this new, fun, exciting club. Uh, and their offense is starting to heat up a little bit. And their pitching staff has a lot of hope to be optimistic as well. So I know that's a not necessarily... Dodgers talk immediately, but all of these guys are on their way and part of the journey to be able to become big league players with the Dodgers. And if they do well, the Dodgers do well, whether they call them up to the Dodgers or whether they use them as part of trade packages. So it's really important to keep these individual players in mind. And also it brings great pride to the organization to see their affiliates do well and succeed. That is something that the organization really likes and really appreciates. Uh, Lux is a top five defensive second baseman based on outs above average, just needs to get the back going. That's 100% right. And that's that is so encouraging to see from the start of the season. Not that the bat isn't quite there. Obviously, that needs to work itself out. But the defensive concerns that were initially present during the start of the season have started to alleviate themselves with the on-field performance so far. So really cool to see uh, for him. And yes, Gavin Lux, if you look at outs above average right now, I believe has two outs above average at second base, which if you look at some of his past performances based on of that metric, which there are different evaluations as far as what is the best defensive outlook as far as what is the best way to evaluate in a player's defense somebody some people like defensive runs saved there can be different opinions on that but if you look at Gavin Lux right now if you look about look at outs above average right here he's in the 94th percentile with two outs above average really cool and encouraging to see the defensive ability that he has shown or some of the alleviation of some of the concerns that we saw early in the season. And if the offensive component clicks, hopefully we'll be able to see the productive and valuable Gavin Stone as a baseball player return. Uh, so I think that is going to do it for here at Dodgers Dogs, part of the Dodgers Daily Network for tonight. I believe tomorrow, Casey and I will be filming a, another show similar to what we did or what Casey and Coach did this morning. If you didn't get a chance to check that out, they go through some of the bullpen, some of the frustrations that they had with the Dodgers and debriefing the San Diego Padres series. Tomorrow we'll be talking about the game Dodgers versus Nationals. Perhaps some talk of a Kyle Hurt, Ricky Minasco, Landon Knack, and some anticipation of them coming up and making their some appearances for the Dodgers, either their debuts or for Kyle Hurt, some of the limited opportunities that he had returning to the Dodgers. There will also be recaps of the minor league action. So I know I went into a little bit of depth of the Great Lakes Loons and what I was able to see because I went Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and then both of the games on Saturday drove up there for each one of those games. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more depth in that game, as well as the rest of the minor league action. Lots to cover, lots to still be excited about. I know the Dodgers lost a series to the Padres, but that series is over, and we got a series against the Washington Nationals that's going to be taking place in a little over an hour. 
Tyler Glass now is going to be taking the mound for the Dodgers. The ace of the Dodgers staff is going to be taking the mound. And let's get back in the win column for the Dodgers. So really excited and grateful for you guys being here, part of this, uh, part of this journey here at Dodgers Daily and helping with the growth of me personally as somebody who's moderating, helping run this show, as well as the growth of Dodgers Daily as a whole. It is something that Casey and I and Coach as well uh, are truly grateful for. Um, we try to take these moments uh, and appreciate them for what they are. And you guys help build this show into something really special and really amazing and have such a great community built around this. Let's continue to build that. Let's continue to grow this. Uh, and so until tomorrow when we will be not live, but we'll be recording a video to be posted out for you guys' podcast. Uh, I just want to say thank you guys for tuning in. Go Dodgers. Go Loons. Have a great night. Let's go win another baseball game.